and uh, since I don't trust it, I just want to make sure it's recording. So yeah, so we should be good, okay? And then uh, what I'll do with the recordings is you see right here where it says uh, Chapter 1 Lecture. That's the old one, okay, from another class. And what you'll do is you'll see Chapter 1 Lecture, and I'll probably put the date or something on there, like today's date for Chapter 1. And then once you have that, you just click on it, and then you click right there, and it takes you out to YouTube, and then you can see the lecture, okay? And um, what you could do is um, hit that little button right there, and, you know, it goes all the way out to, uh, to YouTube, and then you could uh, sometimes see the captioning and whatnot. Um, if you go out to YouTube and you see something that's offensive to you, that's on you. Because YouTube is reading your interest and saying, hey, you would like this, okay? It has nothing to do with me, okay? If you, when I go out to YouTube, it's fat guys talking about accounting, okay? So, um, okay, so, uh, you yeah, know. And you can't always uh, see the, uh, I shouldn't say you can always, because sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, batting average here in terms of the transcription is probably an 80%. It's not like the professional transcriptions where they get every single word. Okay, it's uh, done by the machine. And sometimes I'll say, okay, now we're going to talk about, you know, depreciation. And it'll say appreciation or something like that, you know. So, uh, but it's pretty, pretty decent batting average considering, um, you know, it's being done by a computer. Okay. So I want to get out of this. Exit full screen. Okay. And I'm done with that. So I'm just going to go back to the home page. All right. Now somebody asked, you know, what's the policy on taking notes and stuff? My, my suggestion would be that you get the chapter slides, which we're going to start with these here in a couple seconds, I promise. And um, you go ahead and you download them. You hit that. Tell it to open it, and it'll download it obviously onto your machine. And you can do a couple of different things. You can have the slides like this, and sit there and take notes on the slides themselves using your laptop. You could have your tablet with one of these. You know they're getting pretty good with these pens these days. If you have a Surface or something, write notes on the slide themselves. You could print the slides and I would say guys no more than you know two uh, no less than two per page maybe three if you like to read microscopic writing and you can you know make your notes right next to each slide as I go along those would be sort of the three things I would suggest um, you know you can use a notepad and stuff but then it's kind of hard to link up what I was talking about when the genius thing that I said you wrote on your page um, well, what was it related to? And if you write it right on the slide, it's right there. Okay, so that would be my suggestion. I don't mind laptop. Guys, do not get into the mode of doing anything but accounting while you're on your laptop in my class because I do get a little, a little annoyed of, of that. And I usually know that somebody's not looking at accounting because they have look of pleasure on their face. Okay, so, you know, I'll kind of wander back there and, and, like, stand next to you looking at your computer screen, and you're not going to like that because you're going to be like, hey, buddy, don't look at my, you know, but I feel I, I have to do that because I don't know. You may be sitting next to somebody, and you're watching or looking at something on your screen that's offensive to them, and now they're sitting like, geez, I'm here trying to take accounting. The guy next to me is watching cartoons, and that bothers me, you know, so I will... Uh, you know, police that a little bit. So please make sure you're just kind of paying attention to accounting as we go through the slides. Um, the other thing I want to show you here on Canvas before we get into the discussion is, uh, where's my little Canvas icon, is um, the quizzes, okay, just to kind of alleviate some of the curiosity there. So with the quizzes, again, you get credit for them if you're here, but you'll see uh, in each chapter, sometimes you'll see it called a practice midterm, okay? Those are the quizzes. So if it says quiz slash 
practice midterm, that's the quiz. And the reason I some, you sometimes call them practice midterms is the midterm questions are going to be like these. Okay, now an important difference between the quizzes and the midterm is that the quizzes always have the answers highlighted. The midterms, I won't be doing that. Okay, but the um, quizzes do parlay pretty closely into the exams. So again, the approach is that if you get good at the quizzes, you should do well on the uh, exam itself. And um, then what I'll be opening up a little bit later, I usually don't like to do it the first week, but at some point I'll start opening up these practice exams. So again, weightlifting approach, quizzes, practice exams, tests should not be that bad. Okay, by the time we get to the test, to the actual exam. Okay, any question on that? Okay, and that's pretty much how the whole course is organized there by chapter. All righty. So, with no further ado, let's jump into chapter one. Okay, and if you're wondering what's this all about, you know, I'm not listening to the ball game here. This is... Uh, I just have this for the mic because they didn't have just things that have the mics. They got the headphones too. Allows me to walk around. Otherwise, I'm kind of sitting here trying to talk into the computer mic and it's just says I don't care for that. So, okay. Now I'm just going to get my clicker. Okay, good. So let's start talking about Forms of business ownership, and I'm going to try to kind of figure this out for a while. I'm going to start out down here. You can still hear me back there if I'm standing down here, and if I have to jump back and forth, we'll see how it goes. I just feel like I need to learn how to dance to stand up here, and I'm not a good dancer. Okay, so let's just go ahead and take a look at the different forms of business, and I'm sure you know this, that we have different types of forms of businesses that we can come up with. One is a sole proprietorship. Okay, sole proprietorship usually means there there is a single owner that is also what also managing the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Classic example there might be, I don't know if it's a classic example, but an example there might be a barbershop, right? You don't need a lot of sophisticated management, what not to maybe run a barbershop. And so you sit there and you have your barbershop, you manage it day-to-day, -day, you are the sole proprietor. And that's how you set that business up. Now, major disadvantage of sole proprietorship form of business is there is unlimited liability. So if we're talking about a barber shop and let's say you're giving somebody a haircut and you accidentally cut off their ear and they say, you know what, I did not ask for the Van Gogh special today. What is this? Okay. They sue you for that injury. Then what? Your own personal assets could be what? could be subject to that lawsuit. So they can not only sue you for the barbershop building, the barbershop chair, the barbershop pole, whatever. They're also going to come after your own house, your own personal residence, etc. right? So there's unlimited liability. So the common way of avoiding that is to incorporate. And you go to the corporate form of business. And what you do is you file with the state. If you the corporate, when you incorporate, you file with state. It's a state charter. So you incorporate in the state of California, let's say. Now what? Now if you have an accident, you cut off the person's ear, whatever, they can still come after the assets of the business. You're not going to be able to protect those in a corporate organization. But what? Your own personal assets would be shielded from liability at that point. And that's the major advantage to the corporate form of business. Okay? In in this class, we will pretty much assume corporate form of business for most of our discussion. Okay, we're not going to talk so much uh, sole proprietorship approach. Now, the disadvantage of corporation is it is not as easy to form. In a sole proprietorship, you just hang up your barber pole and you start cutting hair, right? In a what? Corporate form of business, you're going to have to register with the state, et cetera, and go through that process. So you can't form the business as easily. You also will have increased regulation. You're going to have increased regulation, we've already said, from the state that you had to incorporate to begin with. 
You're going to have increased regulation from an organization we'll call the Security Exchange Commission, which is the entity that regulates the financial reporting that we're talking about in this class. So increased regulation. The other problem is there can be a separation between the management and the ownership. So what happens? You form your barbershop and you know you're sitting there and you're saying, okay, I'm gonna be in charge of the boo, I'm gonna be the expert in the bouffant hairdo. I don't know, whatever it is, right? Obviously, I don't know a lot about hairdos, right? So you sit there and you know you're coming up with all these great ideas of what you're gonna do with the uh, barber business, but then you say, hey, I need some increased capital. So you bring in some investors, et cetera. You bring in some seed money, whatever it is. But now they start to have a say in what it is that you do. So they say, well, you know, I don't really think you should be focusing on that bouffant. Meanwhile, that's all your passion. I mean, you know that that's the thing that's going to revolutionize haircuts, right? And you want to do it, yet you're being stopped from doing that, okay? Um, you all heard of Elon Musk at some point in time, right? What happens? He got into a little trouble with this organization we're going to talk about, the Security Exchange Commission, because he, I think, probably what happened is got frustrated one day with his investors and said, I'm going to take Tesla private, and I've got the financing to do it. Probably out of frustration, he says that. Now, SEC doesn't think it's too funny when you go around making comments to the capital markets that uh, may not be the entire truth or may not be entirely accurate. Okay, And so uh, he got into a little bit of trouble for that. But I think part of that came out of frustration and that he's talking about all doing all these different things. He's getting all these other investors probably saying, well, should we go this direction, do that direction? He's thinking... I'm Elon Musk. What are you talking about? You know, who do you think you are? Don't be telling me. And so you would have to deal with that frustration in a corporate setting when you start to bring in uh, outside capital, which I'm sure most of you would. Okay, so the advantage is limited liability. Disadvantage what? Separation between management and ownership and the more difficult uh, increased regulation, okay? Now, we skipped over partnership, and you say, okay, well, what would uh, be a partnership form of business? We'll go back to the barbershop. Let's say you have this building, and it's working pretty good for you, but you have, a, like, three barber chairs in there. But you start to realize that you've got all this extra space in the building that you could, uh, I don't know, put them nail salon in there right and you're saying but I don't know anything about nail you know care and so you bring in a partner and their expertise is what nail care now you've done what now you've expanded the services that the business can provide and you're more efficiently effectively using the resources of the business now adding the nail stations or whatever it is right and you bring in a partner who has a different expertise in many CPA firms are partnerships, okay, and so what will happen, a CPA firm could have an audit component in which you'll be looking at the financial reports of companies and giving an opinion on that, and then they'll have a tax partner in there who's an expert in tax. So what happens during the audit season? We're busy doing audits. When that slows down, we're a little bit more busy doing taxes, and we keep a year-round book of business going that way. And again, this is typically uh, when you form the par uh, partnership, that's what you're doing. The, again, huge disadvantage of a partnership is what? Unlimited liability. It's still like a sole proprietorship and that the personal assets of the owners could be subject to uh, lawsuit action, that sort of thing. Okay? All right, so just to give you a sense of these different forms, again, we're going to be pretty much right here with the corporations for most of the class. Okay? Any questions? Yes, sir. Or is that just becoming a higher leader in a corporation? Uh, it works similar to CPA firm, okay? I'm not that versed in the details of how you know law firms work. But usually what they do is they make you buy in. When someone gets a partnership and everyone says, congratulations, you're a partner in the firm now, and da, da, da. And that is something to be proud of because it's difficult to get to that level. But what no, no one ever tells you is, yeah, and I had to cough up $200,000 to buy into the partnership. And then you get to share in profits, et cetera. So over time, 
uh, it's a good deal, you know, but uh, there is that initial, initial cough up. Uh, I had a friend who was a partner at um, PwC, is one of the major uh, four accounting firms, and um, you know he's probably pulling down around four hundred thousand a year when he finally, you know, he finally retired here recently. So you know, having to cough up an initial investment is usually worth it, but uh, you usually buy in for that partnership. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, do, yeah, uh, you could be end up liable for the torts of the other partners. Exactly. You're not even involved in that, and that can be pr uh, problematic. Now, there is something called a limited liability partnership set up in which you're only responsible for your own malpractice, but others could have structure where you, you know, Joe over there is the one that's doing it, and somehow I'm being personally liable for that. Yeah. Okay. All right, good. Any other questions on that? Okay, now, in this class, we will focus on internal users of financial reports towards the end. That's managerial accounting, okay? Managerial accounting says what are the best, uh, you use the accounting data to identify the best alternatives for the company, okay? Uh, what is my break even? How many units do I have to sell to break even? Uh, how, how should I budget my purchase of capital assets, et cetera, okay? And that comes towards the end of the discussion, most of the end of the class, and you can see internal users, for example, management, marketing, I don't know why human resources, they have to show employees on strike. I mean, that kind of puts the employees in the negative light there, okay? But you have these different... Uh, different things going on, decisions that will be made internally, okay? Now, we're going to focus quite a bit on external users, okay? Quite a bit of what we're going to be talking about in this class is what do we have to put in our financial reports so that investors and creditors can make the correct credit investment decisions, okay? So, if you want to lend me money, you are considered a creditor. If you want to lend me money, you're considered a creditor. So what would you look at if you're thinking about lending me some money? Huh? My what? My credit score, sales, okay. Credit score is going to be something that is what? Outside of the financial reports, right? So yes, you probably would look at that. Sales is something that is going to be part and parcel of our financial reports, right? Okay. So what we're going to see is that we want all of the financial reports of companies to look similar so you can compare company A to company B when you're trying to make that decision about should I loan them money. Do you have another one? Okay, good. Debt, uh, trends, right? I think they're kind of they're kind of doing trends over here, these yay people, right? Okay, and so what happens? You might look year over year at my financial reports to see how things have changed or are changing and maybe even do a little projection on that, right? Okay, but we're going to see that a key part of this discussion is going to be that our financial reports look similar from company to company so that you can decide between company A, company B. Do I want to buy Microsoft? Do I want to buy Apple stock? Do I want to buy uh, Tesla? Do I want to buy Ford, whatever? In order for you to be able to do that comparison, the financial reports are going to have to follow a certain set of standards to be comparable. Okay. So when we look at our financial reports, we see that there are standard setters. And the key one that we talk about in this class is this Financial Accounting Standards Board, the FASB, FASB, okay? FASB is a seven-member board that sets the accounting standards that are followed by all U.S. companies. Seven people. 
seven people. Let me ask you the first question, why seven? Why not eight? There's a tiebreaker, yes, okay? So they have to pass a new standard by a simple majority, meaning four to three. It doesn't mean they can't have seven to nothing, you know, but four to three, simple majority will pass a new standard. They used to have a requirement that it's a supermajority, meaning they had to pass any new standard by five to two. But that was where the companies were kind of trying to slow down the FASB. And so they went and they lobbied the Security Exchange Commission and said, you know, they should have to have a five to two majority. FASB felt the pressure and they went ahead and went to five to two, the supermajority. And then we got into some accounting scandals and whatnot. And SEC said, oh, shut up, companies. FASB four to three, do what you have to do. Okay, so it's a seven member board. Uh, I was on an assignment where Congress wanted us to look at the accounting standard setting process in the United States and they asked us to start by talking to the Security Exchange Commission. Security Exchange Commission was created in 1934, almost a hundred years ago now, and it came after, if it was created in 1934, what do you think brought on the SEC? Black Friday, the Great Depression, right? Okay. Great Depression is so much. It's 100 years ago. There are very few events that happened 100 years ago in history that were still going, ow, ooh, we hope that doesn't happen again. So I wasn't born then, but my dad is 88, and, you know, he still has Depression-era fears. You know, he'll say, hey, don't throw that milk away. There's still a drop in the bottom of the carton. I'm like, dad, it's not 1930." Two, whatever it was when he was old enough to remember the depression okay and so what happens um, it's so much in our consciousness that we still sit here and put rules up that will prevent something like that and that's a lot of what's behind the rules that FASB issues with the Security Exchange Commission looking over their shoulder so when we were asked to look at the standard setting process in the United States, we had to start with the Security Exchange Commission. Security Exchange Commission then says, we're going to arrange for you to talk to FASB. FASB is a private entity that sets all the accounting standards. Those seven members, it's a private board, but SEC is doing what? constantly looking over their shoulder and making sure that they're satisfied with how they're setting accounting standards. So SEC has the legal authority to set the standards, but it delegates it to the FASB, which is a private sector organization. In other words, the government in that case said, hey, we're not going to get in and start issuing standards and telling you everything. Profession, you should go ahead and handle that with your own entity, the FASB, but we're going to be watching them. And we're going to be making sure that we're satisfied with what they do. So we go and we meet with the FASB, the seven-member board. And what's interesting there is that you can't meet with more than three of them at any point in time. The reason being that if you meet with four, they could set policy during that meeting. And if they're going to set policy, that needs to be a public hearing, et cetera. And so in order to have one on one or private meetings with them, we had to meet with twos, threes, that sort of thing. Okay. Now what's interesting is when you meet with them, they tell you, well, there's a lot of things that we would like to do. There's a lot of accounting issues that we think we should resolve by issuing a new standard, but the political environment is such that we can't do that. Okay. So there's a political process here. What happens? If you're I'm going to pick Chevron, okay? You're a big oil company, whatever. And FASB is about to set a standard for your accounting that you don't like. What would you do? Huh? You go and you lobby. Very good. You go to Congress, right? And you say, Congress, don't let them do this. This is horrible. This will be a problem if they do this. Classic example, when FASB was getting ready to set a standard that would require companies to always report 
a, an expense on their financial reports when they offered stock options. All of the companies went and cried to FASB and said, don't let them do this. And I don't know what they said. If you do this, the terrorists have won. They say whatever it is that they think will resonate with Congress to give them an argument. And they pulled back and uh, SEC they, the SEC threatened to take over FASB's agenda setting process. And when they did, FASB had to back off of what they knew was the correct way to treat stock options. Now, what happened is there was a scandal in stock options about five, six years later. And then FASB said, you see, we told you. And now the political environment is right that they could set the standard that they had wanted to five, six years ago. So there's this political process that goes on in the standard setting process all right but we've got FASB with what SEC looking over their shoulder doing what making sure that they're setting standards correctly etc maybe not getting out they're supposed to be leaders but they don't want to get too far out in front of those that they're trying to lead etc so you have that process okay now you have one other entity up here the international uh, any question on FASB SEC relationship before I move on? Because I know that gets a little bit convoluted in there. Who's in charge? SEC's in charge, but they let FASB set the standards. FASB is a private organization. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, that's a good question. I should know that I don't know. Um, I think the existing members of the FASB are in charge of bringing in somebody new, I think, the way that works. But there's probably a vetting process. Um, there's something called the Financial Accounting Foundation. That's the entity that raises the money for the FASB. If you're a public company, you have to pay to play. So when you register on the stock exchanges, they make you pay a certain amount of money that then goes to fund the FASB. Um, and uh, I would imagine that the Financial Accounting Foundation also has some say on that. But I can look that up. I really, I'm not entirely sure on the process, but I'm sure the existing members of FASB also have some process, some process probably SEC gets involved. It's definitely not like the nonsense you're seeing right now for the Supreme Court thing. You know, it's not like they don't have to go through, you know, hearings and all that kind of stuff. And so it doesn't get that, when I say the nonsense, it doesn't get that political. But um, there's probably some politics involved. But I can give you a better answer than that. I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head. And also back down to the fact that they kind of let someone set up the board. It's like five or ten. Oh, okay. Is that what you saw? Okay. Five or ten? Two terms? Yeah. So five-year terms with a renewal of a second term. Did you see the selection process there? Anything on that? Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Um, I mean, sometimes they they draft people uh, because years ago uh, they were having trouble finding a user that would want to sit on FASB. Um, users of the financial reports are usually these heavy hitting financial analysts and whatnot that are probably pulling down, you know, a couple, three million a year on Wall Street. And they wanted them to come and sit in the FASB. And FASB pays, I don't know if you see it there, what, about 500000 a year those guys make. So even though it's a nice salary, I'm not going to give up 2 to $3 million a year gig to come and sit in this ivory tower and set accounting standards. So they literally had to pull a guy. His name was Tony Cope. They had to pull a guy from, from the U.K. to sit on uh, the FASB um, because they were just having trouble attracting uh, users. So they try to have somebody who's an accommodation and they think about accommodations because it's one thing to sit there and come up with an accounting standard that achieves all the financial market objectives you want, but can I teach it? If we make it so complicated that at some point no one really understands what the heck's going on. So they try to have an accommodation uh, sit on the board. They try to have a user. They try to have a prepare of financial reports. So they look for people with different disciplines and backgrounds when they select them. But exactly how they go through that process, I'm not sure. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Now, we also have up here the International Accounting Standards Board. What's this? Well, this is a body 
that sets accounting standards that could be adopted by countries. The United States has not. Now, they say there are over 100 countries that have adopted the international standards. The question is, how significant are they? So what's the number one, number two economies in the U.S.? I mean, in the world, I should say. China and the U.S., and they have different indicators as to which one's which, and depending on which indicators you look at, the U.S. will be one, China will be one, but one and two is the U.S. and China, right, on any given day. Okay, so what happens? The United States does not use international standards. We use our Financial Accounting Standards Board standards. We don't use IFRS, okay, International Financial Reporting Standards. IFRS, the U.S. does not use them, okay? Now, why doesn't the U.S. use them? And the answer is because we're the U.S., okay? <laughs> okay, to a certain extent. Okay, we're not what? We're really not subject to what? Uh, we're not uh, inclined, I guess I should say, to sit there and use what? International standards, even though everybody else uses them, evidence, the metric system, right? Okay, we're not going to switch, okay? Now, part of the reason they didn't want to switch is what? You've got all of your accounting systems set up for U.S. standards, for the FASB standards, and someone flips the switch on you and says, now you have to go over to IFRS. That's going to be costly, isn't it? So when the SEC was considering adopting IFRS, they lobbied. They went to Congress and said, don't do this. If you do this, the terrorists have won. They say whatever they have to to get Congress to say, okay, we're not going to let them do it, right? or give Congress an excuse to say we're not going to let them do it. The other problem was is there are certain aspects of IFRS that if you use them, some companies would have to start paying higher tax bills. And again, oil companies were the classic ones that were going to have to pay higher tax bills. Do companies like to pay higher taxes? They do not. So that was probably the more significant motivator of them trying to squash the SEC going over to IFRS than just the cost of converting your accounting systems. Okay, so the United States does not. That's the number one two economy. How about China? Have they gone over to IFRS? Now it gets a little more interesting when you talk about China because their official position in the Ministry of Finance is that they have adopted IFRS. But I had the opportunity to go to China. Um, there are um, some companies that want their staff in China to take the U.S. CPA exam. And the reason they want them to take the U.S. CPA exam is they're trying to list on the U.S. stock exchanges. And SEC looked and said, well, we're not going to let you do this because you do not have staff that have uh, sufficient U.S. GAAP knowledge. So the strategy that they came up with is they would have their staff take the U.S. CPA exam, pass it, and then when someone tried to say, hey, your staff doesn't have sufficient U.S. GAAP knowledge, they said, what are you talking about? We've got everybody passing the U.S. CPA exam. So the organization, it's called Becker Professional Education, that I teach the CPA exam for wanted a few of us to go over and we would hold presentations about the benefits of the U.S. CPA exam and convince them how easy it is to pass and that sort of stuff, thus selling our course, essentially. But uh, after those meetings, we would meet with some of the folks. And so we got talking about China's adoption of IFRS, and they turn around and tell us, well, we really haven't adopted IFRS. What we've done is we have cherry-picked aspects of IFRS that we like, and that was what the Ministry of Finance based their position on, that we've adopted IFRS. There's a lots of parts of IFRS that we haven't adopted, so we're really still China Gap. So you've got the two main economies not using IFRS. So this slide can say what? 
a hundred companies, uh, excuse me, countries follow it, but the two major economies do not. So typically the case is that it is an emerging economy that is looking for a set of accounting standards that adopts IFRS because they're trying to what? Attract capital from all over the world, okay? And uh, so they will go ahead and they'll adopt IFRS. For example, if you go to United Arab Emirates, I uh, went there and talked about taking the US CPA exam there. They have adopted IFRS lock, stock, and barrel. They've adopted the entire thing, okay? And so some countries have adopted IFRS. Now, what would be an advantage, though, if the whole world, US, China, all the economies, followed the same set of accounting standards, say IFRS? Yes, sir. It'd be easier to trade them. Well, I don't even know if you'd have to have one stock exchange because, you know, sovereign nations want to have their own stock exchange. You got the New York Stock Exchange. You got a Dubai Stock Exchange. You got, uh, I forget, it's in Shanghai. I don't know what they call it in China. You've got the, huh? Nikkei in Japan. So you have all these different. So, but at least as an investor, regardless of what exchange they're trading on, I could compare, say, Arab Emirates, which by the way is a very, uh, not Arab Emirates, you just call it Emirate Airlines, which is the better airline, trust me, don't worry about the stock. I'm telling you, the airline is Emirates is better than say, if I'm trying to decide on United, right? Okay. <laughs> so if I'm sitting there and I'm trying to make that decision is which company I want to invest in, I don't have to convert from US GAAP to IFRS and vice versa in order to make that decision. And so that's what they were going for when they set up the, uh, the uh, uh, International Accounting Standards Board and IFRS. But once the U.S. said, we're not doing this, then the chair of the International County Standards Board, well, at least we have the rest of the world. And I'm thinking to myself, we're well, going to bleed on us now? I mean, you're not getting the two major economies uh, to do it. So it kind of took the, the air out of the balloon. There was a time where they thought everyone's going to go over to IFRS, but it didn't happen. That's why Well, I'm th I think it's more of a uh, historical aspect than a decision of what's better. So remember, we have the stock the stock market crash in 1929. We have the great ushers in the Great Depression, and a lot of the problem was that companies were sort of putting things in their financial reports that weren't true, and so people were making poor investment decisions and were harmed by it. Right. So that creates the FASB. And you have similar parallels, again, for uh, countries like China and other countries, the UK, that, you know, sort of their economies came out of the industrial age into, you know, trading stock and all that. So, and then it's kind of hard for them to give up their sovereign standards, whereas if you're an emerging economy, say, you know, the Middle East or something, and you look around, because IFRS has been around since 73, and you look around, now you're more in the choosing mode, and it makes sense for them to choose international standards that are accepted by more countries. I mean, FASB is only the one. So it's more of that sort of a thing. Was there another question over here? Same question? When I say cherry picking, they pick things that they like about IFRS. The things that they don't like about IFRS, they left on the plate. They didn't pick it up. For example, IFRS says that you can mark your fixed assets to market. And if you have gains, you can put them in something called other comprehensive income, which we won't get into in this class, but you can mark them to market in IFRS. US GAAP and China GAAP says no. You will keep your assets at historical cost, and we don't want you to write them back up. So, again, they picked parts of IFRS that they liked, but the parts of China Gap that they wanted to keep, they kept. So that's what I mean by cherry-picking the things they liked about IFRS. Any other questions? Okay, good. So you come over, and uh, 
you take a look at something called generally accepted accounting principles, GAP. Generally accepted accounting principles, GAP. Okay? And they are established by FASB. So the Financial Accounting Standards Board in the United States issues what? Generally accepted accounting uh, principles. Did I say standards? Generally accepted accounting principles, GAP. They establish that, and then that is followed by companies when they prepare their financial statements. Who's holding FASB's leash? Good. SEC is sort of holding FASB's leash, but FASB sets these generally accepted accounting standards when companies prepare their financial statements. Now, we have basically four financial statements up here, a balance sheet, income statement, where we will supposed to spend most of our time. We'll spend a little bit of time with the statement of stockholders' equity. We'll spend more time, though, with the statement of retained earnings in the early stages of the class. And then you have your statement of cash flows, which we'll learn about. I think it's Chapter 12 um, will be kind of the last thing we talk about before our second midterm. Okay, But these are the financial reports that companies prepare following the generally accepted accounting principles GAP, the FASB standards. Okay, FASB, the seven members, vote on GAP, and then companies have to follow it, right? Okay, now there's also notes to the financial statements which make them more understandable. Without the notes to the financial statements, you would just have a bunch of numbers with no explanations. So we also provide notes that'll say, you see that thing that you saw in the financial reports? Let us tell you a little bit more about it, and it's actual words that are written. Okay. Now, what I want to do here is exit this for a second and see if I can put it in laptop mode without destroying everything. Yeah, sure. There's room. Come on in. Did you want to just sit down? Okay. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is Google on Apple's 10K. And I look at this form 10K. Okay, this Form 10-K is the form that gets filed with the SEC. So FASB sets the standards, but then the financial reports are filed with the SEC. SEC looks at those statements to see that, hey, the companies are doing what they're supposed to, et cetera, right? So they have to be filed. 10-K is the annual report, okay? So they file both quarterly and annual reports if it's the 10 Q, that is the quarterly report, 10K is the annual report for Apple, okay? Now, you come down and you take a look and, guys, forgive me for the year. I don't want to go searching for the current year. It's up there. 2017 uh, is up there somewhere, but since I got 2013, it hasn't changed that much. I mean, the numbers have probably changed, but the requirements haven't. So I start to look over here at all of this information that goes in to this financial reporting. Now, when I look, I'm looking for financial statements, right? Weren't those the things that we saw that all the companies have to prepare? So I can look at the financial statements. And when I do, I get, let's start here, something called a balance sheet. Balance sheet. You have something called assets, something called liabilities, something called stockholders' equity on the balance sheet. But that was one of the statements that we saw that are prepared following what? Generally accepted accounting principles that we're going to study in this class, the balance sheet, right? Okay. Now you come over. And there's also something called the Consolidated Statement of Operations here. Okay, Now, this is similar to the Income Statement. They just called it Statement of Operations. But you can see down here we do report what? 
Net income might be a little hard for you to see in the back, but on here is net income. Do you think net income is reported on the income statement? Okay, so we have the income statement. Okay, so you can see these uh, financial statements that we follow the standards when we issue them. We follow GASB standards are out there in the world, aren't they? Here's Apple's financial reports right here. So it's not like we're just studying something that's going to be in a textbook. Here's the example of Apple's reports. Okay. Now what I want to click on, any question on that? Yes, sir. There are, they're all going to have, of course, different informations. Their operations differ, right? I mean, Ford is going to be a lot different than Apple or Microsoft. It's going to be a lot different than Apple. But the format and the organization, you use the word exact. It's not exact, but it is certainly very similar. Yeah, I mean, there's some flexibility. For example, um, FASB doesn't get all up in companies' face and tell them exactly how they have to array information on their income statement. There's some flexibility there, but they absolutely have to have an income statement. And more importantly, when can I recognize revenue? That is very specific. Okay, because we want to make sure the company over here isn't taking revenue and company over there is not. You think this company's great. Meanwhile, this other company might have been a better investment for you. So how things get into the financial reports is very specific. How it's arrayed, a little more flexibility, but it should be pretty similar. Uh-huh. This is public companies. Okay. Um, Private companies typically are going to be providing their financial reports to private investors. Okay, so uh, banks, small number of seed investors, that sort of thing. And then once, and the further up the funding you go, the more specific the re things that have to be in those reports, and SEC starts getting involved. And by the time you get to full-blown public company, then you start having this full-blown 10K type of uh, filing that you have to do. Okay. Now, how do I know that I can rely on this? 